Hello, everyone. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Siri. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I first of all have to thank my mother, who's sitting right there. I pick on her a lot, by the way. Uh, she drove me from Los Angeles, you guys. I hope you're ready for the drive home for me to pick on you. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, my mother is also a survivor of stage 3 melanoma skin cancer. Um, she's had a brain tumor. She has been my rock, uh, as well as my father, for my entire life with CF. So thank you, Mom, for being here. Um, you know, the, before I get into my presentation, I was here for the experts panel. And if you were not here, I just want to address something that came up a lot, which was mental health. The importance of mental health with cystic fibrosis and just in general in life is so, so important. Um, having gone through two double lung transplants, now facing a third, I would definitely not be able to stand up here and do this sort of thing if I didn't have my therapist, if I didn't have people I could talk to. So please, you know, parents who have children or teens or even adults with CF, encourage, encourage, encourage them to talk to people, whether it's you or somebody privately uh, within their clinic, because as you face these hurdles with cystic fibrosis and with transplant, uh, you need to be able to, to smile and find happiness through it all, even through the hard parts, which you know, brings me to the breathing happiness. Um, you know, I was here on Friday night and I met Jerry uh, for the second time or third time in my life. Uh, but I wanted to just say something about that because it wasn't until after uh, I went back to my room that I realized I had never hugged Jerry. And I hugged him that night because we're both post-transplant. And it was such a powerful moment that had been a decade in the making. Um, and I went back to my room, and yes, I did ugly cry. And my mother thought that would be hilarious to take a photo of. But guess what, Mom? <laughs> Last minute things to my speech allow me to take advantage of that. So yes. <laughs> I did ugly cry. <laughs> I did have to get that out of my system. But you know what? I think that's a score one for Travis, score zero for my mom for the award-winning ugly cry photo. So thank you for taking that photo, Mom, and allowing me just that second to put that in my speech before we did this. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I had to do that. Um, you know, that, that photo represents more than just that hug that I was expressing. It also represents um, the loss that I've experienced with cystic fibrosis and with transplant. The many friends that I've had come into my life and move on um, in their own journeys in, in the universe. Um, and, you know, hugging Jerry, it was very emotional, but also brought on a lot of these other feelings. So, again, kind of looping that hilarious moment back into the mental health, please, you know, take that very seriously um, with cystic fibrosis. Um, before I jump into breathing happiness, I have to address something else. Uh, I started this thing on July 29, 2017, called the Yellow Heart Squad, and a lot of you came up to me and brought up the Yellow Heart Squad the last couple of days, which was so cool. Many of you watching here, probably on the live stream, are from the Yellow Heart Squad. For those of you who don't know what that is, the Yellow Heart Squad is just this little movement I started because I was trying to figure out how I could aid people in their ability to help me. Um, when somebody in your life is sick, so often you run out of things to say. You know, how many times can you say you're praying for them? How many times can you ask for others to pray for them and sending good vibes and being here for you, strong for you, strength for you? There's a certain point after you in 28 years 
where it feels kind of repetitive. And I decided, you know what? Send me a yellow heart. And then I can decide what that will mean. When I'm feeling lonely, it means that you're here. When I'm feeling sad, it means happiness. When I'm feeling weak, it means strength. So I started this movement, and I thank you all if you've participated in that. Every single yellow heart that you have sent me that I've seen online truly, truly makes a world of difference in my life. It brings me up in the lowest moments of uh, my life, which I've had quite a few in the, rec in the recent years with transplant. So we have something else to address as well, which, lead which leads us into breathing happiness. This wonderful contraption that I'm wearing today, the, the elephant in the room, I guess you would say, um, I've been asked a lot for the past several weeks if this is an accessory I'm choosing to wear. <laughs> I guess that's a thing right now. After thorough, re thorough research, I have to determine who wore it better. <laughs> if you can't see the screen right there, which is actually kind of hard to see, Timothy and I are both wearing some sort of brace device. Mine came with a wonderful life lesson. I don't know what his really came with. I, I don't really know. <laughs> Mom, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> Fair enough, his came with the Golden Globe nomination. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Someday. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was struck by a vehicle. I was in a crosswalk and uh, by the way, these little messages I put up with the photos, they are meant to encourage laughter, so don't feel that it's uncomfortable. I meant for you to laugh at those. I was in a crosswalk, and uh, as I was, you know, kind of doing my own thing, I was struck by a vehicle. And as I laid there in my back brace on the pavement, one of the first things I thought to myself was, how am I going to breathe? when I'm already at 18% lung function, which is where I'm at right now. How on earth am I going to continue to breathe when whatever just happened to me is impeding immediately on my ability to breathe? And then I thought about what had been happening all the prior weeks before this incident and that morning I'm seeking a third double lung transplant, and I'm facing all these people who are telling me how rare that third double lung transplant is. And every day, I'm having to tell myself, I'm Travis Flores, I'm a fighter, and I'm a survivor. And I was thinking all of these things as I heard the distant blares of the sirens from the ambulance that was coming to take me back to the hospital after this incident had occurred. And I kept thinking, this could be the one thing out of the blue that will prevent me now from that life-saving third double lung transplant. And jump to now, the recovery has been hard, and it continues to be complicated. But I'm pushing through it so that I can be at important events and meet amazing people like all of you here this weekend. It helps that I have a fantastic family. It really does. And it helps that I have an amazing partner in my life who tells me that somehow I make a back brace and walker look sexy. <laughs> Love him for that. Um, but you know, all of these things can't quite explain how important it is to have that kind of support. <laughs> um, we can joke about it, but at the end of the day, if we don't have the support of those around us, getting through the cystic fibrosis and the transplants and incidences like this that we cannot predict, it's impossible. Um, there are two questions that I've been asked a lot in my life, more so recently than ever before, and that is, how and why? You know, 
how and, how and why am I able to get through every single day with this idea of happiness? And the two go hand in hand. When you identify the reasons why happiness is essential for your life, you'll then find ways to ensure it for yourself. And the logical answers, of course, are people are happy to be happy, the answer to the why. And people do what they love, the answer to the how. And wouldn't it be perfect if it were that simple forever? I've learned that the first step to achieving a daily sense of happiness is understanding and accepting that it's okay to have moments in life where happiness doesn't have logical answers or a straight path to it. I, like many others, wanted to be happy for myself by doing what I loved for much of my young life. It wasn't out of selfishness either. I did plenty of work with charities, but I also had other passions that made me feel good, and I wanted to pursue that good feeling for myself. My why and how were about myself, and that path to happiness worked for a really long time. But when my health started to decline before my first double lung transplant, the how was gone. I was no longer able to do the things that I loved because those things, like many others, require the ability to breathe. As a result, the why started to be unclear then. If you aren't able to do the things you love, the things that make you happy, then why try anymore? That was my thought process, which led to depression. But it was this moment in my life that turned out to be crucial in my ability to discover that happiness isn't one-dimensional, meaning my happiness wasn't just for me. I had to look within myself. I had to make lists of all the reasons why I loved my life and how I can continue to find the things that would make me happy. And one by one, that list became shorter and shorter. The activities that used to be so fulfilling had just become reminders that I was dying of cystic fibrosis. What was left at the end of that list? Names. Not things, abilities, activities. It was names. My brothers, <laughs> Justin and Brandon. My parents, Tim and Teresa. I realized that my why and how were about the people I cared about and who needed me. The importance of happiness was no longer about being happy for just myself. I needed to seek joy and positivity for my family, and I was going to do it by reminding myself of all the moments in life that I still had to be a part of. My brother's getting married, which my brother, my older one is married now. My brother's having kids. I have a niece now. Family vacations. So many things in my life that I have now been able to enjoy because I found those answers within myself when I needed those transplants. I'm gonna leave this photo up here for a few minutes because I just adore my family and we wish they could all be here with us today. Um, so this is my way of kind of doing that, if that's okay. Um, daily happiness doesn't mean 24 seven. Believe me, when I was struck by that car, I was not lying on the pavement smiling, going, wow, life's great right now. <laughs> um, what I mean by daily happiness is finding the things every day that will get you to get out of bed. Enjoying those little guilty pleasures that you may have. For me, it's the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. <laughs> and then find people who allow you to go to bed at night thinking, wow, my life is really fulfilling, and I'm so thankful for everyone who's in it. It also, having, it also has me moments, sorry. <laughs> it also has uh, moments of tears, anger, confusion, emotions like ugly crying, mom. <laughs> emotions are what make this life so unique to each of us. We all feel differently about this life and every aspect of the world. Even when we agree on something, the level of agreement varies. That also means happiness is very individual. We receive it and express it differently. Some people are very vocal about their happiness. 
while others internalize it, and both are normal. We can't tell someone how to express themselves, and that's not what I'm here to do today either. What we can do, however, is help each other find our answers to our hows and our whys, and so that we can become happier people together. It's true that the more positivity you put out, the more people you attract around you who are positive. And the more people who are around you that are positive, the more moments of daily happiness that can, can occur in your life. So before I move on to the superpower elements of this whole speech, I want you all to do something with me if you can. If you're done eating, stand up. If you can. <clears throat> I want you to look around at the room. And I want you to realize that everyone is here to support each other, because we all have something in common. Now, I want you to verbalize, I'm grateful for you, on the count of three. One, two, three. I'm grateful for you. Now, I want you to look at someone in particular. And I'm sorry if one person ends up getting like 10 eyeballs on them. <laughs> Siri. <laughs> I want you to find that person and look at them and think about what they're doing for this community and how impactful it is and what it means to you. And I want you to verbalize that again on the count of three. One, two, three. I'm grateful for you. <clears throat> now turn your attention to the camera in the back. To everyone watching right now on the live stream, I'm going to verbalize it to them, because they're all taking time out of their day to tune in and watch this. So the count of three. One, two, three. I'm grateful for you. Now here's the best part. You can turn back toward this way. <laughs> I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think of every single person in your life that has made you happy, whether they're here or not. I want you to think of the people who have changed your soul for the better and the people who have made you the happiest you could possibly be. And I want you to say I'm grateful for you on the count of three. One, two, three. I'm grateful for you. Now this last one, before we do it, I want you all to take three deep breaths with me, which is ironic because I have 18% lung function, so it's not going to be very deep for me. <laughs> so on the count of three, we're going to take one big breath in and out. We're going to do it three times. So one, two, three, in and out. One, two, three, in and out. Now before this last one, think of the fact that you're all standing in this room. You're all supporting research. You're all supporting medicine. You're all supporting the emotional support that other people need in order to get through cystic fibrosis and get through transplant and get through all the other things that we go through as a community. And I want you to realize that you have chosen to be here. And by you choosing to be here, you're choosing in a way to save lives. You're choosing that. And we don't express gratitude toward ourselves enough. So right now, we're going to take our last big breath in. And at the end of that, I want you to say I'm grateful for you, meaning yourself. So take this breath in. One, two, three. In and out. And I'm grateful for you in one, two, three. One, two, three. I'm grateful for you. Okay, you guys can sit back down. I've never done that out of speaking event, and I felt like this was the perfect opportunity to do that uh, for many reasons, and we'll get to one of those at the end. Um, but I want to go back to the back injury incident for a moment. If you remember, I was at the doctor's office just before it happened, and I remember repeating to myself over and over that I was a fighter and a survivor. Then I left the hospital, and bam, hit by a car. For quite a few years, people have said to me that I was like a real-life superhero. I typically laughed at that because, well, for one, that's a lot of responsibility. That is uh, a tough order to fill. 
Um, you have to stay strong. You have to stay healthy. You have to stay alive. All things that cystic fibrosis don't quite jive with, with me at least. Um, but when that car hit me, something else happened within me aside from the bones breaking. I knew that I had to stand up from this accident to walk, to stay active, and to preserve that little bit of lung function that I had left. And I had to tap into something else to do that. My spine was fractured in five places, and I had three broken ribs. I had to get my mind around those obstacles and somehow see what all these other people had seen within me for years. And that's when it happened. I realized it and I vocalized it for the first time ever. I said, I'm Travis Flores, I'm a fighter, I'm a survivor, and I'm a damn superhero. <laughs> After I expressed it to myself, so much more became clear about life and happiness. And that's what I'm excited to share with you all right now. We're all capable of being superheroes. You're all superheroes in this room right now. Whether you believe it or not, I'm going to explain how. Happiness is a superpower. And when you unlock that superpower, you tap into other superpowers, such as gratitude and love. We've already tapped into gratitude. But having a superpower isn't what makes a superhero. That's not why you're all superheroes in this room. Remember that why and how that we talked about earlier. When you decide to use that superpower, happiness, for the good of other people, that's what makes a superhero. Every single one of you in this room is happy helping other people. The power of happiness and how you've chosen to share it, that's superhero quality. And when you embrace that, when you open yourself up to that power and how you can use it, you rise in this world as a superhero in the, in the eyes of those that you help. But with every superhero comes the supervillain. <laughs> this is actually my cat, Cairo. <laughs> and although he's actually a really huge comfort in my life, he truly looks like a superhero most of the time, or a supervillain, sorry. Supervillain most of the time, and I just thought it was appropriate. He actually has his own Instagram where he's dominating the world. <laughs> um, but as I was saying, supervillains are just as real. But we can use our superpowers to overcome them. It's not quite like the X-Men or the Avengers, but it's better because it's real. When you identify the supervillain, you can use the superpower to challenge it. My supervillain has been my illness. For my entire life, it has created problems and limited me from so many moments that I've worked hard to achieve. My life is a bit more complex, though, because my antagonist in the story is also my protagonist, meaning the CF being my villain has also enabled me to become the person I am today. It's a little confusing. So when I say my illness is my supervillain, I'm referring to the actual infections that I faced and battled. As a child, I went on a three-year book tour for my children's book, The Spider Who Never Gave Up. It helped to raise millions of dollars for charities, including Make-A-Wish and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I was able to battle my infections better, quicker, and with less pain when I was on book tour. My mom and I used to believe that sharing my story with audiences around the country encouraged me to fight harder. And maybe there's some truth to that. However, looking back, I was simply happy. I was so, so happy. That joy was the power that fought the villain within me. All those years, I've fought cystic fibrosis. And I've looked at happiness as just a feeling when it was the superpower. Whatever your villain may be, listen to the superpower I've shared with you. Unlock that ability within yourself because it's already there, waiting for you to use it. I wanna share the most significant example that I can with all of you before I take some questions. This is the emotional part, get ready. <laughs> October 3rd, 2017. As I laid on my deathbed at UCLA, 
for the second time, hoping for the life-saving call to come for my second double lung transplant. A family in San Diego was mourning the loss of their loved one. The phone rang. Hours later, I was in surgery. My life had been saved again. If you remember, I created the Yellow Heart Squad on July 29, 2017. Happiness. Well, on July 29, 2018, I met my donor's family because July 29 turned out to be his birthday. His mom asked me to blot his birthday candles with his lungs for his 36th birthday. I'm going to see if I can play this. Oh, there's no sound? Well, great, we can just watch this and pretend. <laughs> it's still a powerful video, in my opinion. We can clap there. <laughs> Um, since that day, we've grown so close, and I feel that Erica is my sister, Yvette is my mother, and the rest of his family has become my family. I wear a chain every single day that has, oh, that would have pushed play. I wear a chain every single day that has his ashes in it that rest just above my chest where I breathe. And they have joined us here today. And I'm so grateful and so proud that you get to see what your loved one's gift has allowed all these people to get to witness. The happiness we've been able to share together is a true testament to the superpower we've been talking about today. The memories we've been able to create that have somehow eliminated the sense of guilt that so many transplant patients feel. It's a survivor's guilt that you can't explain. And been able to hopefully eliminate some of the grief that you have experienced. That's the power of happiness, ladies and gentlemen. So together, with both of my families by my side, we face our supervillain rejection for a second time. But our superpower of happiness has allowed us to smile through it. It has given us the ability to look at this tragic situation and rise above the loss that we're experiencing right now. We will celebrate his life again tomorrow. And I will be thankful to the Yellow Heart Squad again. Every member of both of my families are superheroes because they surround me with love and countless things to smile about despite their fears of losing me. And you, all of you here today, you're superheroes because you choose to help others with your individual talents and smiles. In times when you feel you aren't strong enough to get through a moment, or when you're afraid of the next moment, close your eyes like we did earlier. Breathe in, breathe out feeling that gratitude, knowing you can unlock your superhero, or sorry, superpower and become a superhero in two steps. Step one is breathing. Step two is happiness. I want to thank you all for being here today. I'm Travis Flores. I'm a fighter. I'm a survivor. And we're all damn superheroes. I'm going to take some Q&A in a little bit. 
Um, and I'll be signing these books that are all passed out to all of you out in the hall. But I believe um, my donor family does have to leave. So before I, yes, of course, stand up, please, if you. If you... Power of happiness, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, I, I'm open to questions if you have any about CF, life, transplant. Um, Mom, I cannot wait to pick on you more. Um, <laughs> parents who have young ones with CF, that's what you have to look forward to. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, Siri went off when, oh, no, no Siri. Siri, Siri, your name is Siri, so it's a complicated situation. <laughs> Yeah, I have an internal battle always with my phone and with Alexa. <laughs> Are there any questions? And I'm open to whatever you may have to ask. Believe me, I've had some very strange questions. <laughs> I've left you all crying. <laughs> Thank you. How am I feeling now after the accident? Sore, um, but you know, every day is a little better. Um, I think it's very similar to you know any injury or, or surgery. Um, strangely enough, I feel like my recovery from both of my transplants was easier uh, than this because this has to do with your your bone and your spine, and that affects every element of balance and breathing and and so many other parts of your body, so, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Can you talk of just about the journey to be listed for your third transplant? I know everybody keeps telling you you're such a, a rare person for that, and I know it's been a long journey, and I'm curious to know more about it. Yeah, um, the journey to be relisted for a third transplant, because um, as you as we've mentioned, is very rare, um, has been probably the most taxing thing I've ever been through in my life. Um, you have to face constant rejection. I don't mean the rejection that's already going on. I mean hospitals. Uh, and, and doctors and surgeons uh, not wanting to touch you, um, despite the fact that you are begging to live. Um, you have to advocate for yourself. I have to give reasons why me over someone who hasn't had a, had a first or a second. And believe me, that was the biggest moral dilemma I've ever faced in my life was even trying to get myself to go through with the evaluation is saying, why should I even try to go through a third transplant when so many other people haven't had their first or second? Um, but then, you know, I look at the people I love. I, you know, I look at the fact that I have somebody in my life that I'm in love with who needs me. I look at my niece who was just born and I don't want to be just a picture to her. You know, I, I want to be a person. I want her to know me. And even if she only knows me for a few years, it's better than not knowing me at all. So it's, it's been a lot. And hopefully I will be back at UCLA soon. Uh, it's been a really grueling process with insurance, which I'm sure a lot of you understand that. Trying to get an insurance company to say, yeah, sure, we'll pay for that. For anything is complicated, but when you like try to tell them you need a third transplant when the first two haven't quite worked, 
it's not, it's not a pretty thing to go through. And, you know, my mom's not here right now, but because um, she just left my donor family, but she has been a warrior in this with me. Um, I didn't mention earlier because I can't pick on her too much, <laughs> but, uh, you know, she has moved her life two times. Uh, forget the first, you know, 18 years of her life being about me, but two times in her life, she's uprooted everything from Ohio and moved to Los Angeles, California uh, for about a year, each transplant, pre-transplant, and then taking care of me after to get me through the, the first months. Um, and she's doing it again. She moved here in April. Um, and despite the fact that I have a partner by my side um, who she has complete confidence in, uh, she knows he needs her too. So she's here. Any other questions? Nope. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, I always forget there's a mic there. Thank you, Travis. It's <clears throat> great to meet you. Thank you for coming here. I know it's a big effort just to show up. So yeah. thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I have a hard question. OK. Um, and that is the, the whole culture of CF is about fighting. And mm -hmm. I loved your talk. It's also not just about fighting. It's about finding happiness. Yeah. One of my mentors asked me, there's a time when we have to lay down our shield and be done. And I just ask you if you've ever thought about that and when is enough enough? It's a really hard question, so it's, if it's too much for you, you don't have to answer it. No, and in fact, I really appreciate you having the strength and courage to ask that question. Um, you're going to be responsible for me crying now. <laughs> um, in January of this year, uh, after I'd already been through the beginning stages of what appeared to be rejection, my pulmonary function had dropped 25% in two months. And I knew, you know, that was one of the hardest conversations with my doctor was sitting down and him looking at me and, and looking at the x-ray and all the reports and you're, you're anxiously sitting there waiting. And he goes, you know what this is, and your heart breaks. Um, and then I got hit back to back with influenza A, mold, staph, and pneumonia all together. And I was in a state of um, uh, basically a coma in the ICU. And when I was laying there, I um, was saying goodbye to my family. Um, I somehow fought through that. And then I was like, I, I need a third. My pulmonary function has, has dropped now to 20% because of this. And the first doctor said no. And of course, you're like, wait, no. And then you go to the next university. And then they say no. And then no, and no, and no. And all of a sudden, you realize that it almost feels like you're hurting your family more by fighting and, and withering away. I weighed 90 pounds at that point. And they're watching this happen. And I, I really, really... <clears throat> I reached a point where I just was ready to put down that shield because there was no salvation. And my only salvation became the peace that I was going to go through something that every single one of us is going to go through someday. And that fear of death became peace in a way. So I, what I would say to anyone who's facing that dilemma right now, I think that you have to consider how tired you are. 
you know, that is a, a decision you have to make for yourself, and no one else should ever dictate that for somebody. You know, if somebody wants to go down fighting, then you let them fight. You, you, the most you can do is, is, is be there by their side and let them do what they need to do. I lost a friend uh, to, oh, sorry, I didn't expect that to hit me. Um, I lost a friend to uh, rejection of her second transplant recently. Um, she was a Duke patient. And um, I had a very, very personal conversation with her husband about that because I needed the tools to, to be able to get my loved ones through that in the event it happens again. Um, and what he said to me was as hard as it was for him to watch his wife lay in a bed and just slowly fade, he had to remember that if he was scared, she was scared. The warriors in the room are truly the loved ones, and I think you know, those with CF, we can all relate to that. The people who are there for us and take care of us in moments when we can't, they're the true warriors. Because I feel like, you know, we have the easy job in all of this. We either survive or we don't. And that's blunt, but that's the truth. It's everyone else that has to figure out how to cope. So um, I think that you know, it's a personal decision, but whatever the decision may be, I hope that you support your loved ones in that moment. Thank you for that question. I think that that's really important to address. And again, therapy too. I mean, for loved ones, not just the patients. You know, my mom's in therapy. She, you know, she needs that for this situation because it's scary. I see, did you have a question? Travis, thank you for being here. Um, you know, I'm reading a book called Forged by Crisis about leadership and how crisis just really um, transforms an individual uh, to obtain those superpowers that you're talking about. And your story is so, so extraordinary. And what you've been through has forged you to be this extraordinary person. Um, what do you know for sure, given the journey that you've traversed and that you're still traversing? What would you say is the one thing you just know for sure? I love that question, um, because there's so many things I'm uncertain about, <laughs> um, especially math. Um, I think that's something that I am for sure certain about is that Love is the most important thing when you're dealing with a chronic illness. Um, and when you don't have those people around you to support you, the chronic illness seeps into other areas of your life, such as your mental health, that make it even harder to deal with your chronic illness. So I think that that is something that I know for sure that I have learned in this life that I would not be here today if I did not have a mom who came and lived with me, you know, for years at a time as an adult. I'm so lucky to have a mom like that. My dad, who has maintained a job and should be retiring, but yet continues to work because he supports my mom in these moments when she comes out here and lives with me. Um, and, and, I, and I hope that's not too vague, but um, there's, there's just the one thing I know for certain. Um, to be a little more detailed and go a little more personal, I guess, with you guys, a great example is that um, I was with someone for five years, and I had a split. And in that split, I lost control of my body. I, I lost 30 pounds. This was before the first transplant, and my health spiraled out of control. The person that's in my life now is one of the only reasons why, aside from my niece, that I keep grasping onto this fight, because I see how much she needs me. So again, love is the one thing I'm certain 
can carry us through the hardest of situations. Any other questions? It's a great question, by the way. I don't know if any of you saw um, the film Five Feet Apart. Um, I'm sure it's been a very popular film within this community. Um, but something else I would like to address quickly before I end this, because I am in media and entertainment, uh, along with you know some other people I know in this room. And I think it's important that you know, as the community, we are very um, careful about uh, the media we support that, you know, puts messages out about cystic fibrosis. I think that uh, Five Feet Apart was probably the best example we could have had with a major studio putting out a story about CF that allowed it to show a lot of the, the intricacies of a relationship and friendship and the hospital and the, um, all the things that we go through. Um, but moving forward, now that CF has become a much more trendy topic, we need to be careful. And we as a community can control those things uh, with our voices and with our support and not support. Um, when you have books that come out like Mallory Smith's uh, journal that came out, which we have... Uh, yeah, we have, we have 10 copies that her mom had, has given me to, to somehow throw at you guys and you can fight. <laughs> um, but supporting books like that and literature like that is important because if we support books like that, those are the movies that are made. Um, rather than supporting books that aren't written by cystic fibrosis patients that have no idea what CF is really like, but they're thinking, hmm, money. We can't allow that to happen. We have, we have to take control of that. Um, actors and, and directors and writers in entertainment who have cystic fibrosis are given such little opportunity um, because of our conditions. So the more we support media that supports cystic fibrosis as a whole, the more chances then our community will have to actually participate in that media as well. So um, please be very mindful of that uh, as you move forward. But I do encourage you all to see Five Feet Apart, um, just because if you're going to see something as an example of CF in the media, I think that's a good place to start. Um, as far as those books go, I don't know how many parents we have in the room that have kids with CF, but maybe that's a way to... Yeah, so I'm going to be out there. If you would like me to uh, sign the children's book to somebody that you think could really use that message of hope or encouragement, it's a silly story. It's about a spider who can't spin a web. I wrote it when I was eight, published when I was 12. Um, but 15 years later, it still raises a lot of money for Make-A-Wish Foundation. So I constantly support it um, however I can. And by giving you all a book here, I'm hoping that you can share it with someone who may need the message later. So thank you all again. I'm so glad I could be here. Uh, and I hope to be here next year. <laughs>